Good morning, everyone. I am Nancy Wadrago with University of Illinois Extension Community and Economic Development, and we're happy to host another session uh, with Devin Bronstein today and her colleagues from the Illinois Office of Broadband. I'm happy to to uh, be able to co-host this series with the Illinois Office of Broadband and the Illinois Broadband Lab. Happy to welcome Devin, who's going to kick off today's session and introduce additional presenters. Welcome, Devin, and thank you for being here, and you can take it from here. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Nancy. Can everyone see my screen all right? PowerPoint slides. All right. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I probably have met everyone here, but uh, for those who might be new, Devin Bronstein, Director of the Illinois Office of Broadband, and really excited today to be kicking off a new series that we're calling a uh, Bead Deep Dives. So we'll talk through a timeline of where we're at as we inch closer to being able to launch the sub-grantee selection process for Bead. Um, but as we lead up to that point, you know, we recognize that there are a lot of concepts that may be new to folks that differ from previous Connect Illinois rounds. And so um, starting today and then in two weeks, we will kick off weekly webinars that focus on different topics. So um, excited to jump in today, both to share information as well as offer an opportunity uh, for your input. So today we're going to be talking about fixed amount subawards and the letter of credit requirement and waiver. So overall, the context here is that, as I said, the BEAD program Connect Illinois round four will be a little bit different than previous Connect Illinois rounds. And it's really important to us to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and ready to participate in BEAD. And so this webinar series is intended to help all interested applicants get familiar with these requirements ahead of the subgrantee selection process. So a couple of goals throughout these webinars, we'll be breaking down different requirements of the grant program, um, we'll clarify specific components of the BEAD program, and then we'll provide regular updates on where we're at, any developments, new approvals, as we hit those final milestones leading up to the official launch, which I know we have all been anxiously awaiting uh, for a while now. So a couple of topics for discussion today. I will provide a quick recap of the BEAD program and some progress to date. Then I'll hand it over to John Wilkins, our broadband subject matter expert, to talk us through fixed amount subawards, lead some discussion, and then go through the letter of credit requirement as well as the letter of credit waiver opportunity. So we'll start with that recap. Um, as many of you know, BEAD is a $42 billion federal grant program and the goal is to bring broadband connectivity to all um, American households and businesses. So Illinois was allocated $1.04 billion to connect all unserved, underserved locations, as well as community anchor institutions. Um, the primary use of these funds is to deploy broadband service. So all of the capital costs that come with uh, deploying that service. Uh, some more specifics about Illinois' allocation. Again, the goal is to ensure that universal coverage across locations statewide. Uh, per NTIA requirements, we are prioritizing fiber connectivity um, where feasible from a financial and technological standpoint, but also encouraging all technologies to participate. Um, we'll prioritize projects first uh, based on their status as unserved, then underserved, and then community anchor institutions that are eligible. Um, we'll run the subgrantee selection process within one year of um, the initial proposal approval. And then we'll focus on broadband affordability by requiring affordable broadband options. So this is kind of a refreshed timeline. Um, while it seems like we have a while to go, we have really achieved a lot since the start of this program last year. Um, so just to quickly recap, we received approval from NTIA on both our initial proposals, volume one and two, uh, the first one in the winter, the second one this past June. We went through a challenge process where we accepted feedback on our uh, broadband connectivity map, um, offered a rebuttal phase, went through final adjudication, and now are awaiting that final approval from NTIA. 
we ran a request for input or RFI process between May and June, where we published initial project area unit designations. So our proposal for how we're anticipating to break up the map of eligible locations and make them available for your applications. So we got feedback there and we are in the process of incorporating it to make sure that these uh, project area units make sense and are feasible for this program. Um, the latest development is that we just closed um, our pre-qualification acceptance period. And so now we are in the process of uh, conducting merit review on qualifications that 41 providers um, and other prospective applicants have submitted. Um, a reminder that this is not required. So if you did not have the chance to participate, we still encourage you to reach out to us with any questions and uh, consider participating in that formal subgrantee selection process this fall. Um, if you have submitted for the pre-qualification process, you likely have received feedback on your initial materials. And if you have not, uh, please expect that in the next one to two weeks so we can close that out by the end of August. Um, we submitted our challenge process results to NTIA and are going through a feedback process called curing, um, and we anticipate that final approval very soon. Once the final challenge results are approved, we'll integrate it into an updated bead map, uh, which will take a couple of weeks to make sure that we get that map right, and then we'll publish the map which will really be the significant milestone kicking off the 30-day countdown to the launch of our application period. Uh, so a couple more steps to go, but we're looking forward to launching that sub-grantee selection process likely happening in October based on where we're at with the latest NTIA approval. Um, and that is where we'll kick off wave one and start accepting formal applications. So with that, I will hand it over to John Wilkins to talk us through our first topic today. John, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Devin. Um, so topic number one, uh, fixed amounts of awards, fixed sub awards. Uh, just to introduce the big picture here. Um, so bead grants, or more precisely bead subgrants. Um operate under a very well-developed body of federal rules with respect to federal federal grants. Um, the really important uh, basis for this topic is um, uh, NTIA at the end of last year, uh, December of 2023, uh, released some quite detailed legal guidance for states to use in running the BEAD programs. And essentially what that guidance did is it created a number of modifications simplifications and really for the purposes of everyone on this call improvements uh, to how those federal grant rules uh, can be implemented by states um, in their bead programs. Um, so we're going to talk about that now, but that's the key thing. And frankly, if uh, we have any uh, federal grant geeks on the call here or, <laughs> or lawyers, um, the, the detailed NTI rules that describe what we're going to talk about now were released on uh, December 26th last year called the Uniform uh, Guidance Policy Notice. Um, and we're going to summarize it here, um, but it is an important document for the B program in Illinois. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, before I talk about the details on this page, uh, I will, again, I will apologize to the to the, the federal grant geeks I just referenced. Um, I, this is really simplifying um, a lot of detail, but but here's kind of the key idea. Uh, uh, the key idea under the traditional way that these sorts of federal grant rules work, just for general all kinds of federal grants. I mean, these rules are written not for broadband, not for Commerce Department. These are general federal grant rules that apply to lots of different kinds of federal grants. Um, you have this traditional approach, federal cost principles is one way to frame them. Um, as implemented for a program like this, the, the, the simple result would be a, a program in which you have a grant, you have a budget, you expand funds to build things eligible under the grant and then you uh, you essentially re submit invoices you know detailed reimbursement requests as you spend the funds um, in this case the state reviews them for compliance and and, and then pays those uh, requests based on very detailed compliance rules 
So I'm sure that's going to sound familiar to those of you that have done prior um, prior grant rules in Illinois or, or elsewhere. Um, the One of the main things that the NTIA uh, UGPN, Uniform Guidance Policy Notice, enabled is an expanded use of what are called fixed amount subawards. Um, now, now, fixed amount subawards, they do exist under the default rules, but in the general federal grant context, they're usually available only in very limited circumstances and essentially only for quite small uh, grant awards. What NTI has done using its legal authority to implement uh, the BEAD program is, is really expanded the way that BEAD subgrants, which is what a state provides to a provider in, in the BEAD program, um, can can use fixed amount subawards to, to frankly improve a lot of how the program will actually work once awards are made by a given state. So, and there's a lot of detail here and we can take some questions if you'd like. The, that detailed document that I referenced from last December goes into all of those details, but from the, the Illinois BEAD program standpoint, there's really two key benefits you're gonna see in how Illinois is uh, intending to implement it. Um, First and foremost, rather than a kind of as incurred, we spent a dollar on an eligible expense, we submitted an invoice to have it have it uh, then reimbursed to us, the state's going to use uh, milestones. And so that's kind of a fundamental thing that fixed sub awards allow, allows the state to do is to define bead program funding releases tied to progress milestones for a project as, as opposed to Again, bottom up detailed invoice reimbursement. So we're going to give you we're going to give you a, an example of what that could look like in a in the next page. But the idea is you have your bead subgrant, you have a set of milestones. As you execute as you execute those milestones, you go back to the state. You describe that you met them. Um, now there is review of costs. This is not saying that budgets and costs don't apply anymore. Uh, but just the review of those costs of submissions can be done in a more streamlined way. So streamlined disbursements. And then the other side of that coin um, is, is frankly a, hopefully a, a, a quite reduced administrative burden, uh, not only on providers, you know, which the state uh, cares about because it will improve participation, but frankly on the state as well. You know, BEAD is a huge program, much, much bigger than what's come before. And so the real reason NTIA has explained that it uh, made these modifications was frankly to make the, the program just much more administrable and streamlined for everyone involved, states, um, states and providers. Okay, so going go to the next slide, Matt. Um, okay, so th this is for discussion. And actually just let me give you a, a little bit of context before we walk through specific, the specifics here. Um, those of you that have been already following closely the Illinois bead materials so far, um, you know, maybe some of you have already read volume two a dozen times and have it all memorized. Um, what you're seeing here is, is the state essentially adding some additional implementation details to what is in the volume two. So of, of the many, many things in the state's approved volume two, there's a short section where uh, the state um, told NTIA what will its plan be for funding disbursements. Um, in the volume two, the state said, uh, we're going to use fixed subawards as enabled by NTIA's UGPN. Um, and NTIA said, great, that's approved. And, and NTIA really is encouraging states to use this model. Um, so now, uh, in this category, and frankly, some others you're going to be seeing in the time ahead, the state is now filling in quite a few more details. So page 11, what you're looking at here, none of this details in volume two. Volume two just enables this overall approach. And now the state is taking some input and this is one approach to what these milestones uh, could look like once you have received the BEAT subgrant in Illinois. So let me kind of, let me quickly summarize it. Um, and then I, and I guess we'll go ahead and do all the slides and we'll just pause for questions at the end. So let me, let me, let me cover this slide and then we've got a few more after this. So, so the essential idea here is First, as you can tell from the way the left-hand side of this page is laid out, um, breaking the the execution of a subgrant uh, into two broad phases. Okay, so phase one, we've used the the, the, the term pre-deployment here. The way to think about that in terms of what uh, could be intended is these would be milestones that 
they do represent forward progress on the project. Um, but these are coming before you, uh, a given provider has essentially started spending all of the hard dollars related to, you know, actually building out fiber or fixed wireless or you know, the actual physical construction that is going to be the heart of the grant. So in a sense, these are to an extent kind of front loading some milestones. So, so the provider can tell the state, yes, we are, we have now made real progress on some of the kind of initial implementation uh, steps of a, of a given project. And we will go ahead and be able to submit uh, some partial milestone payment requests with those early milestones. So I um, mean, first one, grant agreement signed. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty straightforward initial milestone. So the idea there would be actually to say, you know, once you've signed the grant, you, th there is an opportunity to get a little bit of initial funding release. Then uh, milestones two, three, and four, you've done a detailed project plan. You know, that will probably be quite a bit more detailed than what you did during the application phase, because during the application phase, you don't know what you won. At this point now, you know you've been awarded a project, so you have a full project plan. Uh, milestone three, the full network design. You know, you will have had to provide some technical information during the application phase, but now you've been awarded the project. Now you have the full engineering design that really is what you're going to build. Uh, step four, this is a pretty big business milestone. We know um, all of your vendors, your contractors, construction, whatever else, you know, you've got those contracts signed. You maybe have had to make some sort of an upfront payment on those contracts. So at this point, you are actually spending some money. Um, and that's why we think it's appropriate to, um, to make a potential opportunity to have some reimbursement done. And then number five, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about permits and rights away, um, evidence that you have essentially prosecuted all those applications, you have applications in. Now we know that some permits may take longer to be approved, but you're essentially going to the state and saying, we've done all the heavy lifting required to apply for permits. So again, these are these, these are proposals, but what you'll see there is milestones one through five in this pre-deployment bucket, in this version adds up to 30% of the total grant award. Um, th those may be really the, within the first year. So one way to think about these is there might be an opportunity to early that first year of the project, hit some of these milestones to represent progress, but not necessarily huge financial outlays yet, then have some opportunity to get some initial milestones met and get some of the grant funds flowing into the project. Then you go to the second broad phase deployment. And this, as you can just look at the page, you're pretty straightforward. Um, breaking up the project into uh, each decile of locations past. Um, at each of those milestones, you tell the state that you have reached that milestone, you provide some certification, then that unlocks the next tranche of funding. Um, and uh, this, you know, this should look relatively familiar. Um, so again, this is implementation details. Uh, as the state finalizes this, obviously the final versions will be made available to applicants. We know that it is an important part of your planning, but um, this is a, a pretty fundamental aspect of how the state of Illinois intends to take advantage of some of that flexibility and size provided for the B program and then implemented in Illinois uh, to, to streamline things again, hopefully from the state's perspective and from providers perspective and just make it an overall more successful program in the state. Okay, I'm sure there'll be some questions on this. Why don't we go ahead and do the next topic and then we can we can come back and take questions as we go. Okay, um, second big topic, letter, letter of credit. Um, actually, that's fine. Yeah, we, we can stay on this page. Um, hopefully anyone that's been following BEAD, even at the very high level, is aware of the letter of credit requirement that does apply to BEAD. Uh, NTIA has made this very clear from the original NTI NOFO going back almost or more than two years now. Um, as a baseline requirement, if you receive a BEAD subgrant, uh, you have to maintain a, an irrevocable letter of credit it's no less than 25% of the amount of bead funds that you receive. Um, and again, this is in the original NTI NOFO from, from quite a while ago now. Um, and, and actually, just to be clear on something, we uh, Devin mentioned uh, in, in the setup here that there is a waiver opportunity. Just to be clear on that, there is no opportunity to waive the requirement altogether. NTIA has also made that clear that they do not plan on issuing any kind of preemptive waiver from the letter of credit requirement itself. 
Uh, what NTI has done, again, this is uh, in the second half of last year, NTI released, a again, a fairly detailed document called the Letter of Credit Limited Waiver that it essentially creates, again, a number of modifications intended to somewhat improve um, the way the Letter of Credit is implemented in the real world of, of BEAD subgrants. So somewhat similar to the prior topic, what the state of Illinois said in its volume two is we, we the state of Illinois intend to take full advantage of the letter of credit limited waiver and frankly, any other uh, waivers that may come later that NTI issues essentially the state of Illinois is gonna make available to its participants every degree of flexibility that, uh, that NTI is gonna support. And so we'll just talk about what that looks like uh, now um, in Illinois. Okay, so let's just start on the top half of this page. And there's also a really important thing being shown on this page and apologize for all the detail. Um, the letter of credit uh, has, has two steps to it, <clears throat> okay? Um, so during the application phase, which is, as Devin mentioned, will be starting um, pretty soon in Illinois, the, the currently uh, targeting October or certainly before the end of the year. So when you apply uh, as part of the Illinois process, you do have to have a, what is called a commitment letter. Okay, this is not the letter of credit itself. This is not literally an instrument that the state is able to draw on at that time. But it is a clear letter from your financial provider, whoever that is, essentially saying that, yes, you know, we bank X or credit union Y um, are willing to commit to entity, entity A, a letter of credit in support of their um, pursuit of the B program. And there'll be a form letter available for that. But it's essentially you saying to the state that, yes, you understand the requirement, you have a specific financial provider that can do it you have that commitment and so the state therefore can proceed, can proceed on, a, on a good faith basis knowing that if a given entity then receives an award, the letter of credit will not become some huge problem. And, and that's really why this commitment letter is there because the NTIA, none of the states want a situation where essentially someone goes through the process, wins a grant, therefore it, it's hard to give it to someone else without really rewinding everything. And at that point, that provider realizes, oh, we cannot qualify for letter of credit. We don't have one. So there's a there's a requirement that you make this commitment during the application phase. Uh, but then after the applications have been reviewed and scored and resolved and a given entity has been told, congratulations, you, you've been selected for an award. Um, when, when we're at the point of actually signing the grant agreement, Essentially, one of the very last things you will have to do before that grant agreement can be signed is have the full letter of credit itself issued. Okay, so that's the top half of this page. That's the, the basic sequence is commitment letter during application, full letter of credit during or, or prior to actual subgrant execution. And again, the base requirement that's in the NTI NOFO is quite simple. It's just 25%. So if you win a $10 million bead sub grant, that letter of credit must be for 2.5 million for the life of the grant. Now, folks that were following all this last year know there was a big effort. Uh, many, many different stakeholders uh, talked to NTIA to try to get some improvement modifications to that fairly general requirement. And so what NTIA then did was release a limited waiver to that default requirement. And the bottom half of this page then summarizes essentially the key buckets there. But again, I encourage anyone that really is looking at this closely to go look at the actual NTIA limited uh, waiver. It was from, I, th I think, October of last year. Okay, so a couple things. The, the default requirement essentially had a requirement that it be from a bank, a bank that had a certain risk rating. Um, one thing the limited waiver did, it actually said that credit unions could be acceptable too. And, and there's some requirements for what that has to look like, but you use a credit union. Uh, another big uh, modification is an alternative to a letter of credit, which as a financial instrument uh, is a very specific thing. I mean, a letter of credit is basically something that says it is irrevocable, even in the case of bankruptcy, if the, if the beneficiary of the letter of credit, so in this case, the state wants to go draw on that, the bank guarantees it will fund it directly and it's outside of the bankruptcy context. So it's an extremely high security um, 
source of recourse for the for the state. NTI said, okay, well, as a second way to accomplish that same goal of financial security for the grant, uh, performance bonds can be used instead. Now, the amount of the performance bond has to be higher because of the way performance bonds work. Those of you that have been following this, you know, there have been various so, you know, uh, financial intermediaries, bond issuers. You know, there, there's sort of a, a third-party services uh, industry that is uh, trying to meet this requirement. So performance bonds can be used. And then a third broad category is under certain circumstances, NTI said that the, the amount of the letter of credit or the amount of the performance bonds can be reduced from those baseline requirements of 25% for letter of credit or 100% for performance bonds um, under certain circumstances. Um, and again, fair bit of detail there, the state will be putting all this into a final set of uh, specific rules. But the, the key thing to know there, and this actually relates to the prior topic of the fixed subawards and milestones, is one of the options in the limited waiver said that this is this is NTIA now in the limited waiver saying if a state, so if the if the eligible entity as it's called in B, so if the state um disperses funds to a given subgrantee in periods no more than six months at a time, then, for example, the letter of credit amount can can dec decrease from 25% to 10%. And the, the, the essential rationale there is if you're releasing funds only in these relatively short six months at a time intervals, then the state is, is somewhat more on top of exactly what's happening with the grant. The total kind of financial risk, if you will, to the grant I mean, is a bit lower because things are being done in these smaller increments. And so in that case, the, the letter of credit could be 10% instead of 25%. Now, um, uh, you know, kind of creative enterprising states moving quickly, like Illinois, kind of looked at, at that provision uh, and put it up against the prior topic we talked about, about fixed subawards. And of course, the question became, well, how does that work exactly if the state is using fixed subawards and releasing funds on a milestone basis. So for example, going back to the a prior the prior couple pages ago, let's say that you're towards the tail end of your grant and now you're um, in between deploying to 50% and 60% of your of your locations. And just based on how the project deployment is going, that takes nine months, not six months between those two. <laughs> And so then the question would be to take advantage of the letter of credit relief from the six month interval option, the state does plan to make available essentially a, an interim pro-rated milestone mechanism where if you as the subgrantee want to take advantage of the 10% letter of credit waiver, you can go to the state and say, well, I haven't quite reached my next milestone, but we're now in month five and a half. We would like, we want to submit uh, a prorated interim milestone between the last one and the next one so that we are then complying with the six month timing to comply with this letter of credit waiver. And if that sounds a little complicated, it is. And welcome to the BEAD program. But in a sense, this is the state of Illinois just trying to take full advantage on behalf of both the state and participants in the program in the, in the, in the state to take full advantage of these um, flexibility improvements that NTI has made, again, to streamline the program. Um, okay, so th this is it, just a bit of a, of a summing up of the very detailed last couple pages. Um, and you know you can you you can skim this. Um, you know keep key, key points to remember are commitment letter at application, full letter of credit to performance bonds when the grant agreement is signed. And by the way, that won't be till next year sometime. I mean the, no matter how quickly the program goes in Illinois, this is by the time that all the all the different waves have run and NTI has done final approval, you won't be signing subgrant agreements till next year. So letter of credit, commitment letter soon, full letter of credit next year sometime. Baseline requirements are 25% for letter of credit, 100% for performance bonds, but those could go down and the state's gonna make available mechanisms to reduce them uh, if you want to take advantage of that. Okay. And this is just kind of a snapshot of what I just covered a second ago. So this is the bottom of this page. Let's say that you're, the, the, the dark blue dots on the bottom of the page are 
the actual uh, months that you're hitting different milestones. If one of those is more than six months apart, you can use a light blue dot interim um, reimbursement request to stay compliant with that uh, six month timeline for the letter of credit waiver. And all of this will be, I mean, we've got, you know, this has been eight or nine uh, somewhat complicated PowerPoint pages. This will all be spelled out in, in very specific uh, applicant guidance from the state here in the time to come. So take notes, but this will all be documented very clearly before things um, actually open up here a little bit later in the year. Chad, um, I wanted to raise a question I got in the chat related to if someone's taking advantage of issuing a performance bond for the alternative limited letter of credit waiver, um, would the commitment letter need to be for a performance bond in the application phase as opposed to a commitment letter for a letter of credit? Um, so, I mean, I think the you know, basic principle is yes, if you, if you know, you know, if you know that's what you're doing, you have those discussions, that's your plan, then yes, it's definitely going to be just easier and more straightforward all around to go ahead and give us documentation for what you're really going to do. Yes. On the, on the other hand, just to flip that upside down, if for some reason you get a letter of credit commitment letter now, but just as things actually evolve and turn out and in the final, in the final instance, what you actually end up doing is a performance bond. I think that should be, that should be acceptable, but just if you know something now, have it, have it be as accurate as you can based on what you know, because that'll just simplify things. Yeah, I think it's overall assurance to the state that you'll acquire whatever you're planning to acquire. So whether it's the performance bond or the letter of credit. Um, any other conceptual questions before we flip back to the milestones page for some feedback? Okay, well, let's flip back. Uh, all right, we got one question. Um, will you be releasing a model letter of credit or a model letter of commitment? If so, when might they be released and will it be mandatory? Well, let's start with that first question. Well, David, I don't know for sure that's been decided. I mean, there certainly are various templates out there. I'll, I'll put it this way. I, I think that's not been quite decided yet in Illinois, but in general, these letter of credit commitment letters and, and letters of credit themselves, they're all pretty standard. And frankly, in the deed context, they're all essentially coming out of the FCC's requirements from RDOF and CAF2 before that. So if the question is making sure that you are have something reasonable to work with, there are some pretty standard templates out there, and, and I and I think Illinois will be deciding that as sort of all of the upcoming guidance we're going to be releasing exactly what that's going to look like. Yeah, so what you can expect is the formal notice of funding opportunity and then a lot of supplemental documents with frequently asked questions, um, additional guidance. And so I think we would certainly, if not a model or a template, provide guidance on the requirements or things that we would expect to see in those letters. Um, and then looking at Anne's second question, can the letter of commitment be for 10%? Um, well, I can, let's see. So again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for, <laughs> for the state, Devin. I mean, I will say that would be consistent with the NTIA limited waiver. Mm -hmm. um so i think we'll take it under advisement but I, yeah essentially the, the core principle would be the letter of or the commitment letter should demonstrate how you plan to comply with the letter of credit including the limited waiver and so to the extent that's what you're going to do I, I would think that would be consistent with the NTI rules at least yes yeah yeah if you're planning on pursuing the limited waiver and taking advantage of the 10 percent, then the letter should reflect that instead of the 25 percent yeah, you know, and Devin, just one other kind of related comment on that. I think again, uh, folks on the call that are listening closely and thinking about this, there's obviously a little bit of a um, kind of a catch twenty two here, which is you'll have your plans for what applications you plan to submit. You know, so you, you obviously you'll have a you you an applicant will have a 
number of, well, you're going to apply for this much potential in awards, but you're not going to necessarily know what you're going to win, of course. So the amount of the letter of credit commitment letter, honestly, just has to be your, you know, a, a good reasonable estimate based on what you plan to pursue. Um, and, it, and again, that goes back to what I said before, that in a way, the commitment letter is really just state asking for some more specific verification that you understand the requirement, you have a clear plan to get it. But under the fundamental NTI rules, the requirement is that the letter of credit must exist before the grant can be signed. And so everything before that is essentially just the state trying to strike the right balance between not making it too burdensome, but also making sure that applicants give some indication that they do have the ability to comply so we don't have a big train wreck at the end when a bunch of applicants turn out can't get letter of credits. And that's that's happened in past programs. So so again, these are these are things where the balance is just trying to get uh, an, enough upfront information without making it too burdensome or you know impossible to comply because you won't know obviously exactly what your subgrant award is when you do the commitment letter. Um, we got another question. Do applicants have to use the same financial entity for both the letter of commitment and for the letter of credit or performance bond? I have a thought, but I'll let you go first, John. Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 so I think it's a bit of the same point. I mean, so it's not, in other words, uh, I don't, I would not anticipate that it would make sense under the NTI rules, at least to say, well, the commitment letter was from Bank X over the nine months that transpired between then and the actual subgrant, for whatever reason, in business circumstances, something changed and you, I mean, but you got a fully compliant letter of credit from someone else. I don't think that's a particular problem under the rules. So. Yeah. I was going to say like the goal is that you get that letter of credit or are able to issue the performance bond. So if your plans change, as long as you acquire it and have it by the time you need to before the agreement is executed, then that meets the requirement for our purposes. All right, well, feel free to continue to drop questions in the chat. And then I'm going to open this up for a brief discussion. So. Uh, John walked through some of these initial initially proposed milestones that, just to summarize, as grantees move through these steps and offer evidence to the state that they have achieved these steps, it will unlock um, these, you know, cash advances. And the goal is that, you know, we know that um, – there are early on costs for deploying a network. And so we wanna make sure that as grantees, you're not put in a position where um, you have to make a lot of payments and the, the payments from the state have not yet been um, released or allocated. So that's kind of the overall goal here. Looking at the specific milestones, we wanna make sure that this will actually work in reality for subgrantees. Um, so would love any feedback on a couple of things one, are these the right milestones? You know, are these steps that you as an internet service provider go through to deploy broadband? Do these make sense to you? Would you add anything? Would you remove anything? And then looking at both the payment percentage and the evidence, if you have any recommendations on tweaks that we could make, all of this is subject to change. We want to make sure we're getting this feedback early on. So by the time that NOFO comes around and that sub grant agreement is finalized, it makes sense uh, for all of us so we can deploy a uh, effective program. So not trying to reach consensus or expect feedback from everyone live on the call. Um, I will put my email in the chat if you wanted to send feedback offline. Um, but I do want to just take this moment to see if there is any initial thoughts, reactions to this, whether it looks good, things you would change, questions. And any questions about the milestone based payments versus the, you know, strict receipts based uh, reimbursements as well. So we'll just pause here for a few seconds.
All right. I see a question from Cheryl. How often can you validate your locations past monthly or quarterly? So as frequently as you'd like, um, you can submit uh, your certified locations past in bulk um, on that 10% interval, really as frequently as you'd like. And then the state would be validating these on the back end through site visits um, and comparing your certified locations with what we have in that project scope in our grant agreement. So we don't want to hold up um, your progress or the payments, but you know, just know that this sort of validation will be happening on the back end as we go through, kind of based on the volume of requests that are coming through. Um, the one thing to note is, as John mentioned before, the only restriction is if a grantee is taking advantage of that limited uh, waiver for the letter of credit, we do need to make sure that we are um, receiving those reimbursement requests from you every six months or more. And so if you're between 30 and 40 locations, um, we'll work with you to create a sort of interim milestone to make sure that we're all compliant with that. So it's less based on timing, more based on achieve, achieving these milestones. Um, this doesn't, you know, prevent any other or stop any other reporting requirements. Um, that will still be required as part of the grant agreement. This is just kind of how we're getting those payments to sub-grantees. Yeah, by the way, Devin, just one other comment to throw out. Um, so one way to think about this, so these 15, these are kind of current current proposal possibility. We also have heard that some, some, some providers, frankly, would rather do fewer, not more, right? Some providers, for whatever set of reasons, would might say, you know, we like the general idea here, but frankly, we would prefer in our subgrant to just... Um, uh, use milestone, you know, five, uh, five, 10, and 15, right? We, we, we just frankly want to go do all of our stuff up front. Yeah, because even though this will hopefully be a streamlined process in Illinois, it still is a process. You have to organize information, submit it. So if a given provider says, you know, frankly, we would like to just do uh, milestones one through five in one submission and have that be a, you know, under this model, you know, 30%, and we'll just give all the information for everything one through five. Then we want we want to just go build a bunch of stuff, build build half the locations, and do a do a halfway milestone and do a final one. That also probably should be fine. I mean, that's, that can be a pretty common model. You know, the idea is if if a given provider wants it more granular, wants sort of closer touch points, um, wants to take advantage of that six month uh, limited waiver, this would be the the full way to do that. But um, if you want to use fewer than these, that also should be possible as long as it's consistent with the overall structure. Well, we'll sit in silence for another minute, just in case anyone's mulling over this. I know it is, it is all complex stuff. So we're all you know, figuring it out together, but we do want to publish something that works uh, for everyone as best as we can. So we do appreciate you considering this and sharing any thoughts that you have either uh, during this webinar or by email. Okay. Um, any final questions for today about anything we covered or the timeline? What's next? I know it's been a, a couple of weeks since our last webinar on prequalification, so happy to use this time um, to, to answer questions as best we can or jot them down to include in an upcoming FAQ document. Thank you, Devin. I want to thank you and uh, your panel of speakers today uh, to uh, for joining our uh, platform and uh, for all the participants uh, who attended today as well. Um, excited for us to meet back up on August 28th.
uh, for a continuation of this series of um, helpful information. Um, I know the participants today will receive a follow-up with the recording and slides and other program information and, and materials, um, so you can all expect that. And uh, of course, that registration link that we posted earlier uh, in the session, and of course, I'll put it back there, has that updated information on the series uh, that Devin is um, leading and will kick off on August 28th. And so it is there if you'd like to share it with others. I hope you all have a great rest of your week and thank you so much. Um, I did just get a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, just to reiterate, if you want to offer feedback on these milestones, you can email broadband at illinois.gov. I'll share that over email as well. And then we got a question, uh, can pre-qualifications still be submitted or has that fully closed? So pre-qualifications was an opportunity to get early feedback on qualifications for the formal sub-grantee selection process. So um, while you can't submit pre-qualifications for that formal early feedback, you are still encouraged to gather your qualifications for that first application round this fall. And if you did want to just kind of informally talk through your materials um, or ask questions about what you need to demonstrate your capabilities, we are more than happy to do that as well. So um, it's an open flowing process. We, we want to work with you to, to make this work. Okay, and with that, we um, look forward to seeing you in about two weeks. And thank you so much, Devin. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.